Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Dallin, and I'm the CEO of the Samara Center for Democracy. My colleague, Alex McIsaac, is also here. He's our Democracy and Technology Research Coordinator. Uh, we're really excited to be at Tech Tech for the first time. We're beaming in from uh, Toronto and Halifax, respectively. And over the next few minutes, we're going to talk to you all about our work in using AI for civic inquiry, how this relates to some recently tabled online harms legislation here in Canada, and the way that civil society can hold digital platforms to account. And all of this is aimed at strengthening democracy in our country and around the world. Let's start with some background on our organization. The Samara Center was founded in 2008 and is a go-to resource for active citizens, educators, policymakers, public leaders, and journalists as well. We produce nonpartisan, evidence-based insights about how to strengthen Canadian democracy. And our goal is just to make it easier for people to talk about and participate in politics. Chris will show some of and our two podcasts, which look at the lived experience of former members of parliament. Our work examines youth civic engagement, the lived experience of politics, and technology's influence on our democracy, which is what we'll be focusing on today. Since 2021, we've run a research project called Sambot, where we use machine learning technology to monitor abusive content received by candidates in Canadian elections on X, formerly Twitter. As political discourse is generally at its most abusive during campaigns, this project helps us gain some very critical insight into the current state of, of online Canadian political conversations. Through this work, we're able to look at online conversations at a massive scale. To date, we analyzed millions of comments received by over a thousand candidates in a dozen elections. Insights from this work have received national media coverage, are required reading in political science courses, uh, and have been presented at meetings across governmental policy, technology, human rights, and academic spaces. Key findings across our reports include the fact that there's a clear gendered dimension to sexually explicit comments received by candidates, that it doesn't matter what order of government uh, you're pursuing office, um, the, you're going to get a high volume of abuse no matter what. And this, Paul, this makes for very dire working conditions on the digital campaign trail. We've also found that content related to LGBTQ plus rights is correlated with online abuse in some of the highest periods of engagement. And we've also found the need to investigate potential foreign interference in our local politics. We're also able to just quantify the sheer volume of abuse that candidates receive on the digital campaign trail. We tracked tweets received by uh, 300 candidates in the 2021 federal election and over the course of three weeks, there was an average of 511 abusive tweets from all. So these conditions affect not only who runs in politics, but who stays. There's also an impact on the electorate. Our research has found that 47% of Canadian social media users say they stay away from political discussions online because they fear being criticized. Social media platforms facilitate the spread of abusive content in a way that has serious offline consequences, including widespread polarization, the normalization of hateful discourse, and even physical violence. There's a chilling effect subsequently on civic engagement as harmful content is amplified in a way that's out of proportion to its prevalence in the real world. And all of this, as this group uh, likely knows very well, distorts our public sphere, as well as our social and our democratic norms. There's evidence that under X's current ownership, hateful content is not only being under moderated, but has increased, including targeted hate, such as anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric. Um, this is a Canadian problem as well as a global one. 
So we know that platform owners collect an abundance of data that is readily shared with marketers and advertisers for profit, but they heavily restrict and curtail access to researchers who work in the public interest. In addition to increasingly restrictive policies, we've also seen major platforms cancel or suspend civil society studies. Also troubling is the use of litigation to suppress research efforts. Our work with Sambot is measuring the obvious. We know that abuse, uh, harassment, uh, and other information threats abound online, particularly during elections. The response from politicians as well as journalists to our work has been that it's very legitimizing of their experience. So by examining a small slice of the online political conversation, we've been able to illustrate how online spaces, which should be and have the potential to draw people in, are instead damaging our democracy by pushing people away. To date, relatively small civil society organizations have found a way to shine a light on the anti-democratic practices of platforms and advocate for increased accountability. In a period of global democratic backsliding, we need structural changes that support the efforts of organizations like ours. And increased transparency from platforms is one of the most recommended evidence-based strategies to address digital violence. And there are encouraging efforts underway, of course, namely in the EU. So in Canada, we recently saw the tabling of Bill C-63, the Online Harms Act. This is a new legislative and regulatory framework to reduce harmful content on social media platforms. I'm going to turn it over to Alex now to walk us through some elements of this bill. So hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Alex, and I'm the research coordinator in technology and democracy at Smart Center. So the purpose of this bill is to protect Canadians, specifically Canadian children, by addressing harmful behavior online. This entails monitoring seven different types of harmful content, establishing a digital safety commission to enforce the regulation of large social media platforms, and creating a digital safety office and digital safety ombudsperson in Canada, which would receive online harm complaints from the Canadian public. So there are many aspects of this bill. This is a really big bill, but the one that we want to focus on today is uh, how Bill C-63 could potentially require platform operators to fulfill what's called a duty to act responsibly. This would require them to implement measures that adequately mitigate the risk that users will be exposed to harmful content on their services um, and would require platforms to submit digital safety plans to the Digital Safety Commission of Canada. Non-compliant platforms could face major fines, up to 6% of global revenue. And this is very similar um, to digital regulations passed in both the EU and in the United Kingdom in recent years. The proposed Digital Safety Commission of Canada would have the power to accredit certain people or groups who would then be able to access plant platform data uh, in some capacity for research purposes. Accreditation would be based on many factors, including producing work that is uh, intended for educational and advocacy purposes. This process might mirror similar data access goals in the EU's Digital Services Act. Um, but right now, we don't have many details about how this process would potentially work in Canada. Uh, we're interested in learning more about how the Digital Safety Commission would decide who gets accredited and who gets data access. So we have a few questions that we hope that the Government of Canada answers in the coming months. Firstly, which type of civil society actors will be eligible for researcher accreditation? As Sabrina mentioned, a wide range of civil society organizations, not only academics, have produced compelling evidence about how platforms harm democracy. Our concern is that other empirically trained civil society groups who are sometimes able to move faster in terms of how they share results and, and publish papers will be cut out of this accreditation process. The notion of a new digital safety commission in Canada is ambitious and, and this is a moment for, for major reforms are needed, but 
we're also interested in learning more about whether this proposed commission will be efficient. We need to know will data be will be will data be provided to researchers in a timely manner. And overall, will approval and accreditation processes be rigorous but also prompt? And then finally, how will ethics and privacy be maintained in the distribution of this research data? We hope that during this policy development stage, the government of Canada can respond to these questions. Now, I want to share some insights into the Canadian discussion surrounding the bill. Um, which we feel is overlooking a lot of the topics we're discussing today. So some other aspects of the bill entail changes to the criminal code and the Canada Human Rights Act. Um, and some experts are deeply concerned that these measures, which they feel could infringe on, uh, could, could infringe on freedom of expression rights. These concerns were the basis of significant critique um, in the media last week um, when the bill was first debated in the House of Commons. Um, and, and this is kind of dominating news coverage around Bill C63 and this proposed legislation. Um, so we, this is prompting really important discussions about balancing safety and freedom of expression in Canada, um, which we expect will inform amendments to this bill, but we're surprised that very little public attention has been put towards platform accountability um, and what we see as a really monumental shift, that being data access for civil society groups. Um, so it's unclear at this stage what the future holds for the Online Harms Act in Canada. Um, this proposed bill is only in its first reading and there's plenty of time for it to progress and evolve, um, not pass, or just to die on the water table. Um, regardless of what happens, we know that Canada needs to make legislative moves on digital safety thoughtfully, but quickly. And that those moves should certainly include data transparency and access provisions. We're keen to see the role of civil society and citizen participation factor into current and future policy based solutions to help make online spaces safer. This approach offers the power and the insight to hold digital platform operators accountable in ways that governments really can't do on their own. Canada certainly has the, an opportunity to demonstrate leadership by defending its democracy from digital threats and making online spaces safer. But the solution isn't going to be in any just one piece of legislation. The continued efforts of researchers is key to promoting digital safety and defending democracy. So we need to give researchers the tools and supports that they need to be able to hold platforms to account. I'll turn it back to Sabrina. Thanks, Alex. Um, in addition to protecting individuals from harm, legislative responses can also have a positive effect on our online civic conversations and restore some pro-democracy aspects of social media platforms. Um, we'll leave it there for now. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Our presentation today was based on this recent paper. Uh, so if you want to uh, get some more details, please check that out. And we look forward to our Q&A session in the next talk. Thanks.